Living Corporate is brought to you by The Access Point. The reality is, this is the largest influx of black and brown talent corporate America has ever had. And as a result, a variety of talent entering the workforce are first generation professionals. The other reality, most of these folks aren't learning what it means to navigate a majority white workplace in their college classes. Enter The Access Point, a live weekly web show within the Living Corporate Network that gives black and brown college students the real talk they need and likely haven't heard elsewhere. Every week, our hosts and special guests are dropping gems, so don't miss out. Check out The Access Point, airing every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Standard on livingcorporate.tv. What's up, y'all? Zach with Living Corporate. Really thankful again. Thankfulness. Y'all have heard that word over and over and over and over again if you've been paying any type of attention to Living Corporate the past couple months because I am. I'm thankful. Um, you know, for those who who may know, who been just, I don't know, looking at the news, Texas like turned all the way off a couple weeks ago, right? Was no power at all. Now, I want you to understand something. It's not that my house didn't have any power, right? I'm saying like Texas didn't have no power, right? So I go outside of my dark and quiet and cold house. And then I want to go to the gas station, right? And get, I don't know, some formula for my daughter. And the gas station is turned off, right? Okay, I want to go, maybe we want to move, get, go to a hotel so we have some power, running water, hotel turned off, right? And so it was in that moment I realized, though, that, you know, just what matters and what's important. I think that this season has really forced me and I'm certain millions of others to do an accounting for what really matters. And, you know, our house is cold, but, you know, I'm a snuggly person. My wife is snuggly and Emery is snuggly. So we were able to hang out in the bed and chill. And, you know, thank God we had plenty of food and we had a gas stove. So we were able to still cook and keep things warm. And, you know, um, our in-laws, my in-laws rather, Candace's parents, came over tons of water that we still have that I'm tempted to drink every day, but Kansas is like, looks like we have purified water at the house. We need to keep that for the next time. I'm like, okay, my bad. The point is, is that I'm thankful because I just, as challenging and painful as these last, you know, 13 months or so have been, there's been some beauty there in that I've been able to slow down and, and really cherish my family. And thankfully, um, my immediate family and even extended family have been safe, right? I haven't lost anybody um, to COVID. I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for living corporate, you know, shout out to Apple podcasts for, uh, featuring us on their list for black creators. Shout out to Spotify for featuring us on their by black uh, playlist. Thank you to LinkedIn for the feature, right? Just thank you. Thank you. Canaries for the work and sponsoring us and supporting us. Thank you for the winners group for sponsoring us and supporting us. Thank you for just thank y'all. I'm happy. Like, I'm really, really thankful. I, I think that it's in that spirit that I also want to say happy International Women's Day, which was yesterday, and happy Women's History Month. Shout out to all the women out here who history makers. Shout out to my mom. Shout out to my wife. Shout out to my daughter. Emma. she's already making history. You know what I'm saying? She's not even a year old yet. She's already making history. Just thank y'all. Shout out to y'all. Now, Minda Hearts. Uh, for those who know anything about Living Corporate, y'all know Minda Hearts is a, is a friend of the show. She made a really great point, a reiteration that, that many folks have been saying, but she said it most recently. And so it's forward in my mind that it came from her is it's important that for Women's Month, we're being intersectional, right? We're not celebrating women if we're not celebrating all women. What do I mean by all women? Black women, brown women, straight women, queer women, able-bodied, disabled women, right? Trans women. Like we're, we need to be supportive and celebratory and appreciative for the contributions of all women because women make the world go round often at the expense of themselves and so i'm um, please expect content from living corporate that continues to center and amplify those who are on the margins and um, you'll see that right you'll see that through our blogging content with madison butler you'll see that through the group chat hosted by nubiana Aben. 
you'll see that through the break room, right? Which has a diverse suite of hosts. Uh, you'll see that through the access point. Uh, shout out to Tiffany Tate. You're going to see that. You're going to continue to see representation in the space um, that reflects our values and reflects uh, real talk in the corporate world, which is what, what we're trying to have. Now, today's guest, really excited that they took the time to come on Living Corporate's flagship podcast. I've appreciated their work uh, for some time now. I've read their articles and their their blog posts and, and, and so on and so forth. And the thoughts that they bring to the table over and over and over just continue to really lead the space. Like when you think about someone who is just leaning forward and really setting the tone and pace and temperature for this work, when you think about really like in my mind, like there's a it's like a it's a certain echelon of people. Right. And this is going to be exhaustive, exhaustive. But I think about Brittany J. Harris, Mary Frances Winters. I think about Crystal Johnson. I think about myself. No cap. I think about Neil Edwards. I think about Liz Swigert. When I think about like thought leaders who are really like pushing things forward and having like the most progressive ideas and like the like when you think around like centering equity and justice in the space. I think about Michelle J. Kim, right? I think about Goddess Rivera. Right. I think about these people, Nicole Hannah Jones, of course. I think about these individuals, um, Dr. Tima Okun. You know, I think about Dr. Oni and Uche Blackstock. I think about, like I think about the Black Sox. I think about and then and then I also in this in this group of people that I have in my mind, I think about Lily Zhang. Lily Zhang is an incredible thought leader, speaker, educator, author. And I'm excited because we have a conversation that spans a few different things, but we center it on anti-Asian racism and the systems that create or that allow for these sorts of abuses to exist. We talk a bit about this tension between Asian American and black American communities. And more specifically, we're talking about East Asian communities and black American communities, recognizing that. It's a huge swath of cultures and backgrounds and things, but we try to talk a bit about it because there's a lot of tension in the space right now regarding East Asian violence and anti-Asian racism and the source of that and the, the rationale and reason for that. And so we talk about that. We talk about a whole host of things. I'm really excited for you to hear the conversation that we have. But before we do that, we're going to tap in with Tristan. See you soon. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan, and I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. Today, let's discuss job application trackers, what they are, and why you should have one during your job search. Have you ever been in the middle of a job search and you get a call from a company stating they'd like to have you for an interview, but you weren't even sure which job it was for? Let's be real. Most of us have been there. I applied to over 200 jobs straight out of college, and it was hard to keep them straight. So I did what many career coaches would suggest you do. Start a job application tracker sheet. These sheets serve as a one-stop shop for you to remember all the jobs you applied to and organize as access to any additional information that may be useful. Most people make the trackers using Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. You can have as many sections as you would like, but let's discuss some key sections I would suggest to keep all of your information straight. The first three critical pieces of information are the job title, the company you applied to, and the job description. These are the basic foundations of the job application tracker. Most people would recommend linking to the job description. I suggest copying the job description into Google Docs and linking to that document within your tracker since companies often take down job descriptions. This will allow you to refer back to it whenever the need arises. Another section people like to have is application status, such as applied, denied, first round interview, second round interview, offer received, etc. There are a couple of additional sections that can be useful. If you're tailoring your resume for each role you apply to, you should keep track of the version of the resume you've sent. Typically, I analyze job descriptions to identify keywords to modify my resume. I like to track some of those keywords in my job tracker. 
Lastly, if you're reaching out to contacts at the company for informational interviews, your tracker can be a great way to keep track of their name, contact info, and dates of conversation so you can easily reference the information at any point in time. Job searching is already stressful enough as it is. If you can stay organized throughout the process, you can streamline it a bit and eliminate some of that stress. Thanks for tapping in with me today. Don't forget, I'm now taking submissions from you all on career questions, issues, concerns, or advice you think may help others. So make sure to submit yours at bit.ly forward slash tap in Tristan. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. Living Corporate is brought to you by the group chat a bi-weekly web show on the Living Corporate Network that tackles diversity, equity, and inclusion topics your jobs, legal, and HR departments would never let fly. With topics like white supremacy at work, finding out that I'm a Karen, decolonizing DE&I, racial gaslighting at work, and imposter syndrome while black, you may be able to see why, but you may also be able to see why so many folks love it. Between our incredible host, and our guests, which range from Fortune 500 executives to academics to activists to entrepreneurs, every other Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard is something special. So make sure you check out the group chat on livingcorporate.tv. Lily, what's going on? Welcome to the show. How you doing? It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, look, I am, um, you know, we're talking off mic. I am really thankful um, that you're going to take the time to be on Living Corporate you know, as we look at the panoramic of the last, you know, 18 months, or really the past, I'll say the past year, right? There's been so much that's been going on, a lot of focus and uh, increased focus on um, racial equity, on um, using using certain terms. And when I say focus on racial equity, I mean is uh, popular conversation or they're leveraging the jargon. I don't know how much they're necessarily absorbing, like really and, and practicing uh, these concepts are putting anything into into action mm -hmm. but the point is that there's been a lot of conversation around racial equity around uh, white supremacy uh, organizational justice um, accountability like right these are the words that continue to come up right, right. Um, and then there there's also conversations uh because of spurred by the murder of george floyd and the um the other like just documented uh, murders of black and brown people uh, by the state that have gone viral. Um, there continue to be these discussions. However, what has not been as uh, widely talked about, but has over the past, I would say, six weeks or so, gotten um, additional uh, attention has been uh, anti-Asian violence, mm -hmm. uh, particularly like on the coast. And I'm curious, like, just to like get your overall perspective on um, anti-Asian violence and the tensions within which why we don't necessarily speak about anti-Asian violence and patterns of violence against Asians in America. I just, I would love to hear your, your perspective on that, like as a whole, and then we can kind of get into it a bit more specific. Right. Well, first of all, geez, um, this is big, right? This, there's a lot to talk about here when it comes to anti-Asian racism in the context also of, of anti-Black racism. I, I want to just make sure that we start off this conversation acknowledging that these two things are not separate, that they overlap, and that state violence against Black Americans, um, and, and honestly, Black folks around the world, is just the flip side of the same coin of racism that spawns anti-Asian violence. So I want to get that you know, loud and clear in the very beginning. I think regarding the anti-Asian racism that we've been seeing, we've been seeing incidents uh, where individuals on the, the, the street are targeting Asians, usually elders, and pushing them, punching them, violently attacking them. And these incidents uh, have been happening pretty consistently since the beginning of COVID-19's impact on the U.S., more than a year ago, we've seen very highly documented spikes in anti-Asian violence since I would say early 2020. And that those incidents um, are, are only now really sort of entering the public conversation given the recent spate of uh, violent attacks in the last couple of weeks. So on a very basic level, I, I of course denounce this violence that's happening 
But what I want to share today is really ask folks to draw the line, to, to connect the dots between these incidents of violence we're seeing and the broader conversation, the arc, the history of race in America. And, and this, this goes beyond just Asian Americans. This connects how different racialized groups are pitted against each other. This gets into things like the model minority myth. This gets to conversations about anti-Blackness within Asian communities, the heterogeneity of, of racial groups. No racial group is a monolith. Um, where do you want to start, right? We have, what, half an hour? There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me speak to this from the context of, like, of my lived experience sure. as a Black man um, from the South. So like when, so I'm on different like social media apps and some of them um, like more professional leaning, like a fishbowl or blind. Uh, and then some of them, of course, more casual like Twitter. And so um, there are certain spaces and there's certain commentary that I see. And it's, it's almost like this narrative of black people. There's a higher instance or essentially that black people are targeting Asians and that, that, and that black people are like if this is really a black problem this is a problem of black people attacking Asians now as someone who is in Houston and frankly like I just didn't grow up around a lot of east or south Asians like that just like isn't my that was not my context especially I was born in Georgia and so on and so forth it's just, I, that wasn't so I, I can't relate to that at the same time I don't dismiss that because I don't I don't know I don't live in see I don't live on the coast mm -hmm. and so I'm curious I'm curious to get your perspective when that is brought up like these commentary around, well, this is really a black problem and blacks and, and there's a there's a challenge with black people and they're attacking Asian Americans and more in this context, specifically East Asian Americans at high rates. And that this is not really like this wide problem. That there's there's a challenge here and we don't bring it up because we would be called racist if we if we spoke about it pointedly in that way. Yeah, well, uh, I think that's BS. Right. I, I just straight up don't buy into that. So first of all, is there violence from black individuals against Asian individuals? Oh, yeah, you know, definitely. But would I go so far as to say this is a quote unquote black problem? No, that could not be further from the truth. Right. When when you talk about violence against Asians, like let's talk about undocumented Asians that are mistreated by their white employers. Let's talk about white collar violence that happens in the workplace every day where Asians and Asian Americans are routinely discriminated against and mistreated by typically white employers. Let's talk about the violence that, you know, we experience as a community from the state as well when it comes to maybe less in the way of East Asians, but when you look at Southeast Asians and how they've been historically racialized. Racially blackened is one of the, the terms for it, and how state violence falls on them as well. That's what we should be talking about. And I would go so far as to say that looking at these recent incidents of individual Black folks enacting violence on individual Asian folks and saying this is an issue where the Black community is enacting violence on the Asian community is not only false, but actively trying to pit two different racial groups that have enormous links and have so much in common and have actually historically fought for e each other's freedom and liberation in the history of this country at odds with each other. And I would say that the, if, if sabotage is too strong of a word, uh, hmm, it's not good, right? I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's productive. That's not the conversation we should be having. Well, and let's talk about that. You know, when we look back at the civil rights movements, um, you know, not just in this prominent in the 60s and like in the Black Panther movements and in California, but like even before that, like in the 40s and 50s, um, there are documented examples of true co-conspiratorship uh, between these groups yes. and true allyship and partnership. Absolutely. I, and I, I'm curious the, and why I'm excited to have you here, Lily, we're excited to have you for, for a variety of reasons, but excited to have you here. One of the reasons is because my goal isn't to pathologize an entire group. I recognize that the Asian community is vast, right? It's, and it's complex, many subcultures. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about, when we think about this path, like, do you feel as if there's still that spirit of uh, co-conspiratorship, 
um, that we found during the, the, the 50s and 60s civil rights era? Like, where is that today? And if you were to point folks to examples of that continuing, like, does anything come to mind? Yes, yes. So my, my first response to that is I'm not going to romanticize the past. We had co-conspiratorship before, but it was the exception in the sense that the folks that were able to successfully resist the, the siren call of pitting our group against another group were relatively few and far between. I think that continues to be true. That's been true for the entire length of our history. Genuine racial solidarity, whether by simple lack of ability to organize movements that work with each other, or oftentimes by deliberate sabotage and interference, it's been really difficult to create genuine racial solidarity in the history of, of America, right? And, and that's a challenge that we continue to have today. I think there there is that spirit alive and well. I think in the Bay, there is... Asians for Black Lives is, is the first group that I think of. Um, I've, I've done some actions with them in the past. Um, I'm, I'm less involved now, but that's a group that I think of top of mind when I think of organizations that are committed to racial solidarity, to organizing Asians and Asian Americans to you know fight alongside our Black siblings in the fight for racial justice, right? That's, that's just one example. I think it's very difficult, especially given the model minority myth and the the push that many Asians today feel to essentially play the game, keep your head down, don't say anything. And if you play the game long enough, you'll be considered an honorary white person and be able to scrape by in society and maybe enjoy a little bit of success. That's that's the dream, right, for many East Asians, especially East Asians that have new money, right? You're, you, you see this a lot among Asian tech workers um, that, that are a different wave compared to, you know, some of the fourth and fifth generation Asians uh, living in the U.S. that met that, you know, whose families might have come here during the gold rush. And there's there, there's a class difference there as well. I think racial solidarity is not a pipe dream, but I think it requires that we understand, we being Asians, but also anyone that has a stake in racial justice, um, it it requires that we understand our history. And we understand that this idea of solidarity isn't just this um, rah, rah, kumbaya, hold your hands sort of thing, but rather a essential ingredient in what is required to create justice for any of us. Right. And that's been the case during the civil rights movement. That was the case before the civil rights movement. That's certainly the case now. And we need to embody that by resisting these efforts to pit communities against each other. So then let's let's continue this conversation about racial solidarity. It's interesting. You know, you talk about you made a a mention about uh, playing the game. And and I do believe that white supremacy uh, and patriarchy, uh, they create this. Um, they create this carrot, right? Like this, this right in front of you of essentially pursuing whiteness, right? Pursuing your own identity and appeasing to the majority um, and to the power structures that be. In oh, a, you mean like selling out? Like selling <laughs> out. Come on, Lily. Yes. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about sellout in a minute as well. But yes, like there's this idea of, and, and I, I think, but that's the dream and that's the goal that many non- white groups are tempted to buy into, right? This idea of like, look, just don't say anything, keep do what you need to do. And then, you know, you'll get a little piece of this pie. You'll get a, a, a kitty seat at the table and you'll be able to, you know, you're for it no more and you'll be good. I'm curious when we kind of continue this conversation about solidarity, what does it look like to practice solidarity in the workplace? In the workplace. Okay. So this is a little bit of a shift. In the workplace, what I always tell people to do, the the conversation about solidarity and allyship in general, not just in the workplace, is very, very limited. This is one of my primary critiques of it. It's very interpersonal. Look for any allyship guide you find on the internet, and you'll, you'll see things like being a good ally means if you see someone getting spoken over, you speak up. Being an ally means if you see someone facing discrimination, you step in and you say, don't do that. Stop doing that. We don't do that here. And that's all well and good, 
right? That is allyship. But I find that the roots of the issues that all of our communities are facing today are not necessarily interpersonal ones. We're, we're stuck in the micro when we need to be looking at the macro. Hmm. So that means looking at workplaces, what we're dealing with is a history, a decades long history where people of color are being suppressed, where wages are not transparent, where they're low, where people don't have the ability to bring their authentic selves to work, where promotion, hiring, feedback, all of these structures and processes exist in ways that benefit the status quo. For example, you only get promoted if, um, you know, Joe, your manager likes you and Joe, your white man manager really likes playing golf and going to the bar for drinks. So good luck getting a promotion if he doesn't want to play golf with you or get drinks with you, right? All of these things are artifacts of a history of whether explicit or not white supremacy in the workplace. And that means if we actually want to create genuine improvements for communities of color, which is, by the way, the goal of any allyship, right, to actually genuinely improve the lived experience of the group you're allying with, then we need to address these artifacts. We need to change these systems, not just speak up and feel good about ourselves, but to act and do effectively and strategically to change these structures, right? So that's, that's what solidarity looks like. I'm, I'm not gonna tell people to like, make one black friend or make <laughs> one Asian friend or celebrate Lunar New Year one That's year. So and have offensive. A, or, or, yeah, or um, uh, 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 go to the Mid Autumn Festival and eat a mooncake. I was just about to say, order some Chinese no, food. Like, what are you no, talking about? No, eating Chinese food doesn't do any solidarity for us, right? How about you get us paid? Right. How about you get us promotions? How right. about you, you know, strike down white supremacy? That's solidarity. And, and it goes always, right? Asians, right? You don't show solidarity to black communities by listening to rap. I've, I've literally heard that before. That's right. Wild. Like, oh, I'm consuming black music. I'm consuming black culture. Like, like, yeah, you and everyone else in America, right? right. Like, what are you doing to actually like substantially and tangibly elevate the lived experiences of black community? Come back when you have an answer, right? Because that's what solidarity looks like. That's what it takes. Let's talk a bit about like just the, the intersection of identity within these groups and, mm -hmm. and and how that creates challenges right so like when i th so you, you talked about things being limited and you spoke about systems too which i love because i i, I do agree of course that it's easy and I, I think this is part of like this capitalistic and patriarchal structure that we have that we love the story of the individual right so we love like underdogs we love the idea of like this person individually going to do this thing and like we're, we've been conditioned, I do believe, culturally, to really reject systems thinking. Like we, we, uh -huh. we like will quickly categorize anything that talks about a system as, you know, blaming or being a victim or whatever the case may be, as opposed to really understanding this larger machine that we're all a part of, right? Uh -huh. um, I'm curious though, like when we think about DEI as a space and we think about like how limited it is. What do you believe needs to happen so that we're also being inclusive of uh, trans and non-binary identities within uh, black and brown communities, right? So I, I frankly don't see much effort uh, or thought leadership that really specifically centers trans black women. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I don't see that. And I, I don't see a lot of content that centers trans. You should follow Elle Hearns. Okay. Um, she's, a, she's a black trans woman. Um, I, I believe one of the original people behind Black Lives Matter, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, yeah, she's phenomenal. I love her work. Fantastic woman. I, I had the chance to um, interview her for a panel a couple of years back. I'm going to make that note. I'll make sure to follow her. And I agree that, that there's thought leadership out there. When I think I'm speaking to more specifically like this corporate DNI thing. Oh, corporate DNI. Well, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. To be clear, no, yeah, no, I know, no, no, no. I know for a, I know for a fact there is 
uh, plenty of thought leadership and authorship on trans and our binary identities within um, black and brown communities. Like there's there's work out there. And so I am not not at all dismissing that. More so thinking about like in the workplace and what we call DNI as a as a space. Oh man. Well corporate DEI around trans identity is somewhere in the nineties. Like we're we're just sort of stuck there right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like like the the big shift right now has been moving from um, this very old stereotypical notion of of the sort of go on leave, uh, come back to the office a couple weeks later and like, poof, you're a new person, right? You change your name, your gender. Um, now you can live as your authentic self, which is a very sort of 80s and 90s uh, narrative of, of how trans people in the workplace operate. It was very binary. Um, it was very white. That's kind of the yeah. the corporate trans inclusion yeah um we've started moving in this direction of no now now we recognize non-binary identities and now we're asking people to put their pronouns in their bio like okay great um but they're all still white people and that's a problem right right, right. like like we we have this very sanitized safe way of conceptualizing trans identity which is well if you're not being loud if you're not being aggressive, by the way, these these are all racially coded things. Mm -hmm. if, if you're not being loud or aggressive or causing trouble, if you're okay, just kind of, you know, being yourself and not being too demanding or harsh, um, then yeah, sure, I, I, I guess we'll give you inclusion, right? And am I going to say it's worse than what it was in the 90s? No, it's not, right? Like I, I personally, like I'm non-binary, I use they, them pronouns. It's great to get they, them pronouns used for me in a corporate setting. Do I appreciate that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Do I think things are any better for, for example, Black trans women now compared to the 90s? No, not at all, right? Because the conflation of the intersection of anti-Blackness, of transphobia, of sexism, right? The, uh, the term being trans, trans misogynoir is the uh, portmanteau of all of those things. Um, that's alive and well. Right, we we haven't done much around that because doing that requires us to actually tackle racism and sexism and transphobia in the workplace. Mm. And if there's anything corporate DEI is really bad at doing, it's solving multiple problems at once. Yes, <laughs> I was about to go off. Yeah, I'm gonna say it's my pocket. It's my platform. I own this place. I, they're they're bad at solving problems generally, um, and they're certainly bad at solving multiple problems at the same time. It seems as if it seems as if like when there's multiple problems to be solved, which is all the time, it's like they just create more problems. Uh, so I agree. Now, look, before we go, though, let's talk about your book, Ethical Sellout. Sure. Why the title? What's it about? Why should folks buy it right now? Sure. OK. What it's about. So we really dove into the stories of marginalized communities, people of color, trans people, disabled people, queer people, all of the above, really trying to understand why it was that that these marginalized communities were sharing so many similar stories of struggling to survive and thrive and live authentically in the sort of, for lack of a better word, complete dumpster fire of late capitalism that we're currently in right now. And what we found is this sort of universal experience of needing to make compromises to survive in your day to day, needing to, to really make these big ethical decisions around, am I going to work here? Am I going to live here? Am I going to put up with people that have these sorts of values? What's strategic? What do I need to get by? How do I maintain my connection to my community in such a messed up time and place? And we found that everyone, literally everyone we talked to, was going through these same sort of dilemmas and doing so alone with enormous shame and enormous guilt. People got the feeling of like, well, my community has it figured out. They're all together. They all act as one. Everyone knows how to be a good blank, like a good trans person, a good Asian person, a good disabled person. And because I can't fit that model, I must be a bad person. So we wrote that book because we figured out that all of that was wrong, right? We are all going through these questions all the time, trying to find our own place in the world, trying to make sense of what we can do as individuals to survive under systems of oppression, systems that are actively harmful for us. Um, the book was our attempt to collect these sorts of stories to show people that, like, yes, if you are marginalized, this experience is not unusual. You're not alone. This happens to so many communities. And also to say, and now this is what you do about it, right? This is how you find balance. This is how you practice self-compassion, how you stay honest, how you stay accountable to yourself if you do things like enter the system to change it from within. Um, it's, it's something that I read passages from all the time as a consultant because 
um, you know what they say about authors, right? You write the book that you need to read. And I certainly needed to read this book to square my own participation in corporate life, right? As a DEI consultant. So yeah, that's, that's the pitch. If you find yourself experiencing these things, if you have these big questions about your place in the world and, and, and what social justice or DEI means in the context of what you're going through, uh, check it out. I, I would highly recommend it. I hope that you find the stories relatable and the advice um, actionable for you. Lily, thank you so much. This has been incredible. And like I said, look, I knew based on just your LinkedIn and the content that you write, I was like, I know that we're going to run out of time, but we're going to do a part two, three, whatever. Okay. And I, sure. and just thank you so much, y'all. Make sure you check out links in the show notes and make sure you check out Ethical Sellout. And until next time, I will talk soon, Lily. All right. Take care. Thank you for having me. Peace. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Break Room. Have you ever felt burnt out, depressed, or otherwise exhausted by being one of the onlys at work? You know what I'm talking about. Hosted by black psychologists, psychiatrists, and PhDs, The Break Room is a live weekly web show in the Living Corporate Network that discusses mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. Name another weekly show explicitly focused on mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. I'll wait. This is why you got to check out The Break Room airing every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on livingcorporate.tv. And we're back, yo. Thank you so much to Lily Zhang. Cannot wait to have them back on. They are also a friend of the show. Really excited and thankful for their contributions, the thoughts that they were able to provide, and to the conversation we were able to have. I hope uh, that you check out the book ethical sellout it's in the show notes make sure you click that and uh look y'all until next time it's been zach you've been listening to living corporate catch y'all next time peace living corporate is a podcast by living corporate llc our logo was designed by david dawkins our theme music was produced by ken brown Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.